Being a black woman brings its own specific challenges. Intersectional feminism was meant to address this intersection of race and sex. In recent years, intersectionality has been used to force the inclusion of biological males into the purview of feminist goals and in turn has overlooked minority women, such as women of color and same-sex attracted women. This trend has also facilitated the use of black women as props within transgender activism and implicit racism within the community, which centers transphobia as being a far worse crime than racism, homophobia, or misogyny. One of the most blatant examples of this can be seen in how those who ascribe the gender ideology choose to exclude and demonize certain individuals while overlooking the social ills of those within the in-group. The most well-known example can be seen in Harry Potter where J.K. Rowling, see I pronounced it right this time, decision to continue to speak on the importance of maintaining single-sex spaces has led to mass cancellation and abuse. Meanwhile, Daniel Radcliffe rubs elbows with white supremacists but is still held in good graces due to removing his support from JKR and vocally supporting trans rights activism. A less well-known act of racism can be seen in the comparison of the exclusion of trans women from women's spaces to segregation, and in the argument that black women and trans women are similarly excluded from womanhood. To that first statement, it must be obvious to anyone who views race as being a fact of diversity of genetics rather than a statement on inherent ability or goodness that one does not pose danger to another based on race. Sex differences remain despite race, despite ethnicity, and have always been acknowledged in every culture. This ties into the patronizing statement that non-white countries required the colonizing hand of the West to know what sex was. As if China needed the West to let them know whose feet to bind, or that Africa needed to be lectured to know whose genitals to mutilate. Postmodernism likes to pretend that common facts of life are hypotheticals that can be debated and denied out of existence. In pretending that there is no truth, it denies that sex-based oppression is a real and identifiable experience that women around the globe have faced since the start of commerce, if not sooner. Trans women are not excluded from female spaces because they are seen as lesser women. They are excluded because they are not women. Women, regardless of race, need spaces free of men. Although social pressure is not foolproof, having set boundaries makes it harder for men looking to abuse and assault women in public spaces more difficult, as can be seen in the Target study last referenced in my JKR video, which found a strong increase in sexual harassment within bathrooms, which resulted after the publication of Target's gender identity policy for its bathrooms. Segregation based on sex is a necessity to protect the safety and privacy of women and girls from men. Segregation based on race is based on a premise that one race is inferior to another, which is blatantly untrue. To the second statement, it is important to note that black women have always been treated as women. Slave masters knew which slaves to abuse and impregnate, and regardless of lesser treatment on account of their race, there is a long history of mistreatment against black women based on the intersection of their identities. For example, the modern field of gynecology was formed of knowledge taken from the abuse of black women. <laughs> hey, hey. Let's talk about it. Midwives in the African countries of Tanzania, Congo, and Uganda have been successfully performing C-sections for hundreds of years. The mother would be sedated with a lot of banana wine, and the tools used during the surgery were sterilized with fire. The midwives would also clean their hands with wine as well, and then wash again with water. The baby survived, the mothers recovered well, and they were given herbal treatments to promote wound healing. Infection, shock, and excessive blood loss were pretty uncommon. The most reported problem was that it took longer for milk to come in, so usually friends and relatives would help the mom nurse the baby. R.W. Falcon actually documented a C-section that he witnessed in Uganda. To him, it was a marvel that needed to be spread to the rest of the world, and it was. This is Habarian Gemma. Follow me if you want to learn more about African politics and pop culture. Historian Deidre Cooper Owens coined the term medical superbodies because black women stood at the crossroads of being a universal norm for healing. Because clearly these doctors could use these women to cure any women. And yet their bodies still held these racialized fictions. For example, that black women are more hypersexual or levitious. Black women don't experience pain. Black women are immodest. All of these things tie into this belief that, somehow, black women were intellectually inferior to white women, but also physically stronger, without any linkages being made to the fact that most black women were agricultural slaves. 
There was a focus on the fertility of black women as, when the Constitution banned the international African slave trade, there became an issue with how the U.S. was going to maintain and grow this very lucrative system of slavery. The solution was to concentrate on natural increases, which simply meant making sure that enslaved women had children who lived past the age of one, because slavery was a condition that was passed to the child from the mother. What this did was lay at the feet of black women an added responsibility to have more children. Let's talk about the mothers of gynecology. For too long, 19th century physicians like Dr. James Marion Sims have been considered the fathers of modern gynecology. But it's actually the invisible enslaved women and children who were experimented on by Dr. Sims, who were the true pioneers. Three of these women's names are known, Anarka Westcott, Lucy Zimmerman, and Betsy Harris. Anarka was only 17 when she endured 30 painful and unsuccessful surgeries. Doctors held the belief that black people, especially black women, did not feel pain, a racist belief that permeates in medicine today. Dr. James Marion Sims is considered the father of modern gynecology after experimenting on enslaved women in Alabama. He performed these crude surgeries without anesthesia and due to his experiments on black women found himself as one of the country's preeminent gynecological surgeons less than a decade after he began his gynecological career and eventually served as the president of the American Medical Association in 1875 and the American Gynecological Society in 1879. These experiments form the basis of gynecology on which modern medicine still relies on today. Yesterday I made a video about how racism can get passed down in medical textbooks. One of my followers who's in nursing school right now sent me a picture of her study guide showing how these biases are still in the literature. Under the African American section, they say that there's a lack of African American male role models, that African Americans eat fried foods and are less likely to eat fruits and veggies, especially men. But my problem with things like this is these things are thrown out there without talking about the racism that caused them. They make this broad claim that black people eat fried foods, but also don't talk about environmental racism. Of course, they don't talk about how institutions for decades blocked African-Americans from getting professional jobs. Even the questions, this one reads, a fatherless 11-year-old African-American girl lives with her grandmother, are primed to make you think about the black community in only one way. When it comes to European Americans, it's positive statements like strong work ethic and future-oriented. These are the racist stereotypes taught in medicine. Faulty notions of pain management and differences in races have continued to affect medical treatment even outside of gynecology. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Black and Hispanic people receive worse care on 40% of the department's care quality measures. Racial disparities are particularly striking in pain management, with studies showing that Black patients are significantly less likely to be prescribed pain medication and that they generally receive lower doses of it when they are. One possible reason for this, supported by existing studies, is that white people believe black people experience less pain. In another study, Trow Walter and her collaborators showed a group of medical students and residents two cases, one concerning a black patient and another concerning a white one. They then asked the students to rate the patient's pain, to recommend treatment, and to report the extent to which they agreed with statements about biological differences between blacks and whites. On the list were statements such as blacks age more slowly than whites and blacks nerves endings are less sensitive than whites. All the statements included were false. For this study, the team had crafted a new hypothesis, that a person's belief in the biological roots of race would predict their perception of black pain. The team based this prediction on false claims made by physicians and scientists in the 1800s, which asserted that black people were biologically closer to apes, while white people were more evolved. Beliefs about biological differences between the two races have persisted into the modern era. Even today, some people believe black people are more athletic because of their biology. What's interesting about these beliefs is that, contemporarily, they're actually not strongly related to racial prejudice, meaning that even people who report very positive racial attitudes will think that perhaps the black body is fundamentally biologically different from the white body, Trewalter said. Regardless of how enlightened the left claims to be, that they continually argue that black women are similar to men illustrates the lingering racist ideas held about black people, particularly black women. Black women are women. Men are not women. The categories of sex are mutually exclusive. This can further be seen in other aspects of life. The Institute of Women's Policy Research reports that more than 4 in 10 black women experience physical violence from an intimate partner during their lifetimes. White women, Latinas, and Asian-Pacific Islander women report lower rates. 
Black women also experience significantly higher rates of psychological abuse, including humiliation, insults, name-calling, and coercive control, than do women overall. Sexual violence affects black women at high rates. More than 20% of black women are raped during their lifetimes, a higher share than among women overall. Black women face a particularly high risk of being killed at the hands of a man. A 2015 Violence Policy Center study finds that black women were two and a half times more likely to be murdered by the men than their white counterparts. More than 9 in 10 black female victims knew their killers. Black girls were suspended or expelled from public schools at much higher rates than other girls. School administrators are more apt to perceive black girls as disruptive or loud compared to other groups of boys and girls, and black girls are more likely to be punished for dress code violations, talking back to teachers, and defiance. The adjective black refers to the race of the woman in question. It is a qualifier, which is applied once her sex is acknowledged. Quite simply, black women are women, trans women are not. However, the addition of race is a qualifier that is often used in the argument regarding the suffering of black trans women. When the phrase trans woman is not enough, trans right activists like to point out the high numbers of abuse that black trans women face and how their experiences point to the immense suffering they face on account of transphobia and racism. These studies are faulty in their interpretation. Take, for example, the lie of trans murder rates. In 2019, overall trans homicides numbered 26 individuals, or 0.001% of which one was a white trans woman and 24, or 0.02%, were black trans women. Black trans women are the only vulnerable group of trans people in the United States, and they are only so disproportionately subjected to violence as a result of a poverty-impelled tendency to resort to prostitution for survival, and because of rampant homophobia present in evangelical Southern African American communities. It wouldn't matter if these people identified as women or not because they're killed as a consequence of being poor, black, and experiencing homosexual attraction to other males. White trans-identified people are among the least likely demographics of people in the United States to be victims of lethal violence. However, black trans women are often presented as a prop to shut down any criticism of trans arguments, as if by virtue of being in several marginalized communities, those men are free of criticism. This allows for black trans-identified males to have an unprecedented amount of privilege against women and girls, as they are seen as a subcategory of women instead of as men who identify in a certain way. This coincides with the narrative that a black trans woman started pride, which steals credit from the biracial butch lesbian and gay men who were actually there and played major roles in creating the first pride parade. The presentation of trans women holding up the backbone of the LGB community offers a nice excuse for deterring questions about their behavior, both personally and on a grander social scale. Take for example the case of Avery Chanel Medlock, previously named Demontre Duval Satchel, a 25-year-old male who was kicked out of a cheerleading camp and issued a criminal citation for assault after allegedly attacking a teenage roommate. Well, come outside then. You're a man. I'm not a man. If, if uh, I'm a girl, my, my license says uh, I'm a female, bitch. You have a okay, and what are you going to do about it? She, bitch, I barely touched Charlie. As a joke. Bitch. It wasn't funny. What part was laughing? People care. Well, get us into humor. Okay. And let me know the problem. So, it doesn't have anything to do with me being drunk. I'm not drunk. I have one twisted tea, and I'm above age to drink. So, if you want to tell Nicole, you can tell Nicole. Mr. Medlock claims his confrontation with 17-year-old Carly at the community college came as a response to transphobic and racist remarks made by the girl. He said that the confrontation was only a joke and never escalated to physical violence. Carly's father disputes Mr. Medlock's account, insisting that his daughter had locked herself in a room with other terrified girls as the male cheerleader raged outside. Mike Jones says his daughter was choked out by Mr. Medlock and is calling on responding officers to release body cam and CCTV footage of the incident. Dina Stanley, previously covered in the second episode of my Criminal of the Week series, is another example. Despite being an adult man who assaulted a teenager, he's been painted as a sympathetic character by the organization he works for on account of being a black trans woman. Black women are women. Men, no matter how they identify or what race they are, are not. Black trans-identified males are just as male as any other XY chromosome haver on this planet, no matter what they wear or how they bully others into addressing them. 
It is blatantly racist to refer to black women as being similar to men and doesn't take into account the history of dehumanization that black women have faced and continue to face with the subpar treatment of their pain and experiences. As Jennifer Silen writes in her article, it's simple, black women are women, men are not. It is not only incorrect, but also profoundly racist to argue that, for example, black women and trans women are the same or even similar. This argument that both are somehow subcategories of women relies on the assumption that black women stray in some way, even slightly, from one or more of the two primary elements of womanhood, human and female. Transidentified males, by definition, are male. Black women, by definition, are female. Simple. This, dear viewers, is where we part. This topic is one that I've been considering for quite a while, ever since, hell, earlier this year. And one that I'm just very frustrated with, because recently I've seen a huge influx of just racist behavior within the trans community that never gets called out. But the moment you question how their behavior might affect women and girls, you're kicked out, you're ostracized, you're gone. But it seems as if the trans community is perfectly fine with uplifting racist voices, which shouldn't be a surprise considering how much of it is filled with white conservative men. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please leave them down below. Thank you to my supporters. I really appreciate those of you who've been, you know, offering support on Patreon and buy me a coffee and all that because I'm currently in the middle of jobs, you know, trying to settle back in the U.S. And I would do this either way just because if I don't, then I'm going to annoy everyone around me with my discussion of feminist topics. Trust me, you get two beers into me and I'm... I have to tell you about how gender ideology is horrible, and that's probably not the most conducive way to meet people at parties. <laughs> um, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know down below. Server is open, Patreon, you can vote on video topics, etc., etc., and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!